What's up, world? It's your boy, Mike Muse. Welcome to Conversation with Mike Muse Show. I am so excited to be in conversation with my next guest. Um, she is someone that is so special. I think needs to be protected and amplified because she is trailblazing out here and giving us the content that we have been asking for. We've been asking for so much variety in the content to show like the complete vision of blackness and its wholeness. Uh, we have range. We tell multiple stories. We live multiple lives and we come from different eras. But for some reason, media keeps pinpointing us and pitching hole us until it is one dynamic. And me and myself have been dying for more variety of content. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy the content that's out there right now. I love what the black content creator space is doing, uh, but I want more. I want more of a breath of it, which is why I was so excited for that film American Fiction. Uh, I thought American Fiction was really good because it really was this hysterical piece about how studios and executives and even us as black folks, our culture, we love low hanging fruit. We love low frequency and we don't want to be challenged. Mm. Um, and that bothers me how things are challenging, smart, esoteric and satirical, but also could be entertaining and funny, uh, often to get overlooked or is so hard uh, to produce and, and projects. But I had the chance to moderate uh, our guest. I'll say her name now you know i like to wait a little bit later but i moderate uh kiara kilpatrick diara kilpatrick um for this new show diara from detroit in detroit for 313 day and i just had the most fascinating conversation with her and we i said i needed more time uh, i needed more time with her to unpack what she's thinking how she's thinking um and to celebrate and my goal is just to do my best to amplify it so that it gets a second season a third season and that more shows like this gets created. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Diara Kilpatrick, what's happening? Yo, thanks for having me. It's so yeah. good to see you. You yeah. have such a beautiful, warm energy. So I'm already excited to talk to you. I am excited for you to be here. And audience, uh, we were up here vibing with the Beyonce album. Yeah. And I found out Diara can sing. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I was just saying, I like to sing. I like to sing a yeah. lot. Mm -hmm. And But being from Detroit, if you say you could sing, you need to know how to sing, sing, yeah. sing with an A, mm -hmm. you know? And so I don't know that I've ever felt like a Clark sister. Yeah. But I do, I do like to sing. But I think because Detroit is like uh, one, the hair capital of the world, the car capital of the world, yes. and the church capital of the world. Yeah, the so, wine ins, the, the shears is yeah. Yeah. It's, well, you guys have great, greater grace. Is that Greater Grace? I think so. I think it's Greater Grace is out there. But before, like, even like, oh, Justin's shaking his head, too. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's really before, I thought Detroit was holding down the church gospel scene even before those mega preachers, like, came into position and where they are now. But I think Detroit held it down. So, I'm Detroit adjacent being from Lansing, Michigan, but yeah. we get all the run-ons, right? Yeah. And we will always fellowship with churches in Detroit. And, Yara, to your point, my pastor, I was leading a solo. I mean, I'm in high school, right? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. But like you said, if you're black and you come from the Michigan, if you're in some church capacity, of a choir. Yeah. I was leading the solo and Davian, I thought I was blowing. Uh -oh. Right. And the pastor literally comes up the steps and he says, can you hear yourself? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and let's just say that was the last time I ever did a solo in the church. Hilarious. And I was like, this isn't my gift. Well, you know, my dad has a similar story. He's, you know, he's in his 80s now, but he was doing a talent show in Detroit when mm -hmm. he was a kid. He got up there and sang and he felt like, OK, I feel good about that. You know, yeah. he sounded like a kid should sound. <laughs> and then the next kid that got up was Smokey Robinson. Ooh. And he was like, OK. So, yeah. <laughs> so this is not my ministry, actually. This is not. And I don't think he's sung since. Yeah. <laughs> Detroit runs through and through your blood, it sounded like. Oh, absolutely. The church, it kind of like forms you. Yeah. What was it about like growing up in Detroit that gives, I think a lot of Detroiters such a strong constitution. Mm -hmm. I've met so many Detroiters who just know themselves so well. Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, I think for one, it's a black city. Mm -hmm. Growing up as a young black girl it was really affirming. Um, I felt really loved and protected. I went to Bates Academy. It was sort of the black nerd school. <laughs> yeah. I was like, friends who went to Bates, Joel Steingold. Joel! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So, so Joel's mom and my mom kind of ran in the same, like, we're taking our kids to every single artistic thing that's happening in the city. So I would see him when I was growing up all the time. Um, but yeah, we felt really affirmed and I loved it because I would always say, you know, the smartest kid in the class was black. The dumbest kid in the class was black the prettiest girl, the ugliest girl. So it was like, you could be whatever you wanted to be. Being black didn't necessarily mean you had to be one particular thing. And I think that freedom was really, 
I don't know. I just felt like I swam in it. And I went to the same school from preschool to eighth grade. So to be in that environment for 10 years was really just a beautiful thing. Yo, you kind of messed me up with that that right there. I'm wondering if that's the key not only to why your content is so good, but sometimes why some black content is a miss, right? Mm. Because I went to, I grew up in a neighborhood that was 60, 40, right? Where 60% white, 40% black. Mm. And, but we didn't feel like we were in the minority. Like it, right. just, it was just that good percentage where everything just felt equitable, right? right? There, I'm sure there were some things that was happening, some isms that was happening, but it wasn't dominant. Yeah. And so for me, I, I saw the smart being black, but also the smart being white. Uh-huh. And so I saw just a different lens. But then I also, interesting, saw, like, my principal was black. Right. right? And so I had black teachers. So I had, right. like, this really unique set of purview of that one. But I think there's something powerful about seeing the smartest person being black and then the dumbest person being and black. And that's a, that's a rough I, word. Yeah, but we the, shouldn't the say most that. Challenged so let, me edit, student. let me edit that. Let me edit that. I, was having too <laughs> I much, said it I, first. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the smartest person being black and then those who struggled you know, academically, but who are still smart and right. gifted and just in, in other areas. And so when you see that range, you're more open to creating complex and nuanced characters, I would think. Right. And it doesn't, I think, you know, it doesn't embarrass me to put up a black character that has flaws. Mm. Um, I think sometimes that happens too. Like sometimes all the characters are, have too many negative attributes, right? But then I also think the flip side of that is sometimes black creators want to create these pristine images of black women who don't curse and they don't do anything and they, they fall so squarely in respectability politics that they're not human. Mm. And so for me, the, you're going to find the humanity of a character when they're trying to do a thing and maybe failing. They may be trying to do the right thing and they're not always arriving there. So that's the space that is most interesting for me to play in. Mm-hmm. I think that goes into the humanity because one of your characters in this show um, seems to be dealing in uh, uh, illicit affairs. Yeah. Um, but is such a warm and loving human being, almost like a teddy bear effect. Mm. You're talking about Diara, the main character. Yeah, I mean, she's in a messy place, Mm. you know, and I didn't want to shy away from that. And I didn't want that to take anything away from her, right? She's still deeply a kind person, a loving person. She cares deeply about her students and her friends, but she's going through it, Yeah, you know? And I don't know that we often get a chance to see female characters in general do that without it being like desperate circumstances you know what I mean and so this is really still a fun entertaining story you know um we exaggerate some things here here or there for the sake of entertainment um but yeah oh and I wanted to go back to what you said because I felt like it was so astute when you were talking about being entertaining and challenging yeah that's my motto as a that's like my personal statement as an artist is to entertain and challenge so the entertainment thing is really important for me. It's a a lesson I had to learn because I used to be like really didactic. Like, here's my opinion and everybody's going to get it. And y'all are going to have the same one by the time we finish up here. Um, and so I've tried to shy away from that and the preachiness, but to still challenge, you know, the viewer by by kind of reflecting the times and not shying away from some of the harder harder or harsher realities of our experience. But you're proof positive that you can be both. That and you can do both. And Thank you can you. be entertaining and you can be challenging. But I think it just requires paying attention to your craft and right and just being a good writer, right? And like and being a good storyteller. Like you don't always have to go for the easy low hanging fruit, right? Like you can you can be challenging, you can be nuanced in that in that middle part of it. Thank you. I, you know, I'm honestly trying to entertain myself mm-hmm. most of the time. And then just like, that's why when people are like, even the tweets are really positive. I'm like, oh, thank God, because I really was trying to entertain myself. And I'm just really glad that it's resonating with other yeah. people, too. I think there's something about what's happening in on television right now, because uh, the character, the lead character, Diara, is a school teacher. Mm-hmm. And I think like we're seeing a lot of school teachers on television. Yeah. Uh, but I think it was very unique about her being a teacher. And I feel like in Detroit, and let me know if I'm right or wrong, but it seems like teachers really matter in mm-hmm. Detroit. I, I, a lot of my friends in Detroit still talk about the teachers they had growing up. Yeah, my mine certainly did. My preschool teacher was at the LA premiere and it meant 
the absolute world to me because my mother was a single parent. She had to drop me off super early and I'm four, it's preschool. And she didn't feel comfortable with me being in the building like an hour or so before school was even supposed to start. Mm -hmm. And so my, my preschool teacher was like, I'll bring her, I'll bring her to school. Just drop her off at my house. Mm -hmm. So I would go get dropped off at my preschool teacher's house before the school day started and have breakfast with her and her husband who actually Turns out is a Judge Greg Mathis oh, from yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at the time he was just Yo. a young I don't even know if he was a, a judge at that point or if he was just a young lawyer and she was a young yeah. teacher and she would drive me to school and I that is almost I wouldn't recommend that. You know, if yeah. somebody said that today, like, oh, I have a student, I'd be like, uh uh-uh, uh, get that child out your house. She could slip and they could sue you for all it's worth. But it was just about the love and her trying to help out my mother so she could get to work on time and, and feel secure about what where her child was. And so it is that kind of going the extra mile that, you know, we didn't know her before before that. So that sort of ran through my experience at Bates the entire time. Um, and that's where that relationship, there's a relationship in the show between my character who's a teacher and one of her students mm-hmm. that's very familial and, you know, very comfortable mm-hmm. and almost to a comedic degree. And that came from um, not that relationship, but another teacher I had who used to take me off campus for lunch and tell me her problems and her issues. And, you know, she she was the first person to tell me that the government killed Easy e by putting AIDS in his food. Okay. And for that, I was afraid of the school lunch for years. <laughs> OK. That's after right. that, you know, so she had a she had a point of view. Yeah. Um, but she was really just loving and affirming as well. I see why now your ensemble audience, this is an ensemble um, show um, that I think is really well done. Thank you. And I think ensemble shows are hard to nail. Yeah. Uh, because it could go awry, it could be too busy. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are different storylines that are happening, but the storylines are very connected and tied together so well in this interwoven aspect of it. And I think that's a tribute to your cast, who are incredible actors. I've had yeah. the chance to connect with them and get to know them too as well. But it's seemingly, as you're talking, that growing up in Detroit, everybody is just so interconnected, mm-hmm. right? The way you talked about the teachers, even when you talk about Judge Mathis, I'm mm-hmm. thinking about my friends in Detroit, they were talking about judges' conversations were as common that mm-hmm. came up, like Judge Bradfield, like Judge, all these other judges from the city of Detroit, yeah. and everyone seemed to know everyone. Yeah. And so it seemed like that constitution gave you the ability to create an ensemble of knowing what it means to be interwoven and, and interconnected. Yeah, absolutely. And I always say I'm from all of Detroit. You know, my mom, when I was growing up, we lived in Section 8 housing. Mm-hmm. My dad, who I mostly saw on the weekend, was in politics mm-hmm. and he would run campaigns. And so it would be very common for me to be running around, you know, Calumet townhomes mm-hmm. with a bunch of kids, some who had come from across from the projects or whatever, running around. And then the next day be on a boat with the governor. And so I feel like I had a really broad experience Mm -hmm. and um, I probably never fit in anywhere that I go, but I can fit in everywhere that I go, if that Mm -hmm. makes sense. And so but I'm always like a. Like I have a larger perspective that I'm always a little bit removed from it so that I can observe, observe it and have that sort of strange point of view on it. But I think that just came from the way that I was raised. You going to NYU, was that did you always know you wanted to be a writer to tell these type of stories? Because when you can go back and forth between so many different worlds right i yeah. feel like you always will have stories or narratives in your mind or oh let me let me let me change that i feel like you will always have conversations in your mind yeah with yourself about like what you're experiencing yeah i had to surrender to the writing okay. you know it was something that i could always do but it's a it's, it requires so much focus it requires so much alone time And I really like to be around people and I really like to be busy and I have kind of like I can have sort of like a frenetic energy and to just really sit my butt down and write it. It sometimes it's like painful. So for a while, I didn't really want to do it. But I that's why I feel like I'm in my purpose, because it just you know how they say when you're in your own lane, the trap, there's no traffic. When I was just acting, it was like getting each thing was like such a fight. And then once I started writing as well and taking it more seriously, 
the world just kind of started to open up a lot more. And I also recognized that part of my purpose wasn't just about me getting up on the screen. But as you mentioned, there are some fantastic actors in this cast who, you know, when I saw um, Dominique Perry and Claudia Logan, who are also just brilliant in the show, when I saw the videos that they had made when they found out that they were going to be in the show, it brought tears to my eyes because I recognized like, oh, that's right. You're blessed to be a blessing. It's not just about you or to hear, you know, Brian Clark, who plays a, a queer man on the show, like feeling like this was the first time that there was a character that really felt like the queer men that he knew and not just an caricature. approximate a, a caricature or whatever. And he felt like he got to be so himself. So that, to me is also the gift and and the work is realizing that it's about the community as there's well something about when you're doing what you're supposed to do it's supposed, it, there's supposed to be a sense of ease yes mm -hmm. yes a sense of ease about the flow that, that you're in um wow you're very centered and grounded in your purpose <sighs> oh thank you i you know mike i feel like my mother passed in 2019, and it was one of those things where I was just like, oh, it's go time. Like, this is your time. It, it created such an urgency in, in me, and I feel like since then I have really tried to breathe the signs, <laughs> you know, and just – and just ground myself so that I can give the gifts that I'm supposed to give and get out of my own way. In your presence, you can feel it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And it's something that's rare. You know, I interview a lot of, like, entertainment people um and you can <laughs> were you about to say weirdos yeah <laughs> you know i I'm interview like, a lot of weirdos yeah, and um... <laughs> <laughs> and you can always tell when it's genuine you can always tell when it's self-serving mm. um but it's really rare that i meet people that who are already using their platform to help others like with a broader scope it's usually people who are like once they are double oscar award winning mm. right like triple dipple production deals yeah then they start talking about the give back right and, and the pulling up and get out of my head it's so funny because <laughs> i've had people along the way be like will you mentor me and i and i was like no like because i didn't feel worth like i didn't feel like i had anything to say i didn't feel like i I had a friend who I think I kind of hurt her feelings because she was like, can you mentor me? And I was like, for what? Right. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then just recently I was like, oh, I need a group of mentees. Like I I even though I don't know what I'm doing all the time, like it's I, I'm at the point now where I need a group of mentees. And so I just sent out the email to I had met two girls when I was here doing a screening at NYU. And I just sent out an email saying, OK, we're going to do some seasonal check ins and we'll get on a Zoom and we'll just talk, you know, because, yeah, I do think it's it's important um, because it's just a it's a practice, you know, whether you have a little bit to give or a lot of bit to give, like you got to give something. I love that. That's the human side of you, like being vulnerable. Right. Because we always feel like. Where we are is not where we want to be. It's it's never enough. Yeah, and there's always doing somebody else is doing something bigger and better than you. Not really realizing you went from Detroit, a powerful city, a wonderful, loving family, a strong constitution, got to NYU, and is now having a show on BET Plus that you wrote. Yeah, and that you are starring in, and that you have created. That is huge. Yeah, and it wasn't until I saw the billboard that I was like, damn, I guess I need a mentee. I'm telling you, like, <laughs> where am I giving back to? Today. But sometimes yeah. we're so caught up in just our day to day and trying to make it, right? Yeah. And trying to hustle and trying to be successful, don't even realize like our stress is somebody's blessing, right? And so yeah. I think I'm glad that you're being open to do that and, and be the mentee. I do want to talk about the concept of DR from Detroit mm -hmm. because I don't even know how to describe it. I've been telling my friends about it and they're I'm just like it's like a murder mystery but funny mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah. comedic but then like a psycho thriller like how, <laughs> how would you describe it cuz it's so multifaceted like this cross genre of yeah. like storytelling which audience it sounds like a mismatch of things but it's done so well. Yeah, thank you. You know what's funny is there's a lot of crazy shit going on in this in this show, and all my friends are like, "It's so you." That's like the number <laughs> one thing. They're like, "Oh my god, it is so you." Um, yeah, it is a a blending of genres. Uh, it's a mystery. It's a comedy. It has romance. Um, 
and I think I think it's just a dark comedy. I think that we've seen this before, but we just haven't seen it before with black people and black people who are really culturally specific black people and the setting being such a character. Mm-hmm. Um, but on its face, you know, it's it's also a portrait of a woman who is a hot mess and who is going through a really hard time and trying to fight her way through that. But um, this first season is an origin story for a private investigator. And she gets pulled into it, you know, in a really relatable way, which is that she gets ghosted and she can't accept it. <laughs> you know, I, I just met a girl today and she was like, every time I get ghosted, I'm like, you must be dead. And that feels really reasonable, I think, to a lot of to a lot of women because we're so amazing. You know, <laughs> it's like, uh, why would this person not want to call me back? Right. Like, he, I'm dope. He must be laying in the gutter. Yeah, he's dead because I'm dope. Time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so a lot of my girlfriends, they would tell me their stories about being ghosted and they would say it so casually. Like I met this dude and he ghosted and then I met this other dude and I ghosted because yikes, you know, and I was like someone who's been with my husband now for almost 20 years Good. nearly. Um, great. I Thank you. In this era. <laughs> I, know, I know. I'm like, I if I got out of my marriage, you know, hopefully no, never, but I don't think I would be good at being ghosted. Mm-hmm. I think I would want explanations and apologies and all that all the things a letter letter, right Mm -hmm. um and so that is sort of where that part of the idea was born to Mm -hmm. kind of just like hunt down hunt down an explanation and then realizing that oh dude might be in trouble audience what you're gonna love about this uh if you haven't already seen it yet is the unpredictability of where the storyline goes. Yeah. And just when you think one character is about to say something, there's something the way you write it, it just pivots and switches. It, 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 the, the comedic timing is so great. It's, it's, it's not forced. It, oh, it's very effortless. I'm just thinking about that, that there's a scene, and I'm, I'm not going to give anything away with this plot, but there was, the, there was a moment in the scene where Diara's character is having a rough day and She's in the shower, and, mm. and, and then you say something like, I can't even take a trauma shower without worrying about my hair getting wet. But it was yeah. just so... The so- struggles of being a black woman is like, you want to sit on a shower floor and cry like you see the white girls do in a movie, but you got to keep your edges together. That's too much, you know? Yo, that took me out when I saw that scene, <laughs> right? And always, you got to see the way her body language is positioned. She tried to avoid the water. The physical <laughs> acting is good, too, as well. So Thank talk you. to me about how do you know when to pull back when you're going down like a predictable line of conversation and all of a sudden you just pivot? I think it's Detroit. I think that is the tone of Detroit and that is the tone of the show. Whereas you never really know what's going to happen next. And I thought, did, did we talk about the the case in Detroit of the missing boy? No. There was a missing boy in Detroit Um, in the 90s and I remember his little cute little face his cherubic cheeks he went missing from a mall and um, he was never found again and some people thought his mother had something to do with it and then years later right before pandemic a grown man walked into a Detroit police station and he was like I'm that boy oh my god I am him and they put it in the newspaper Detroit News and I was like riveted I was like holy shit where's he been what happened to him and they checked his DNA and they found out that in fact this man was fucking crazy just nuts. Oh, he's just a crazy. Just oh, a man wow. who walked into a police station on a Tuesday and decided to claim to be a missing person. And that had me howling. <laughs> I was like, sir, yeah. what, <laughs> what, what prompted you to do that? And yeah. to me, that is how Detroit always turns itself on his head. It's like, oh, my God, it's DeWan Sims. He's back. Oh, no, he's not. He's not. <laughs> That's just Johnny. This man is off his meds. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I could think of a million stories like that. Yeah. You know, my grandmother getting her TV stolen by our relative who was on crack and her going in the crack house. Like, I need my TV back because I need to watch Walker, Texas Ranger. God damn it. You know, and there's just there's so much tragedy and <laughs> comedy in every moment and so that's what we really leaned into at the tone of the show is that you never really know how things are going to end up Mm -hmm. um and that to me is a lot of fun because it's just my point of view on everything like Mm -hmm. I, i can always see the comedy in a situation and i can always get to the depth of something pretty quickly too 
I couldn't think of a better way to end right there. I mean, mm. you sold the show <laughs> on, on that one. And I think the audience is going to enjoy getting to know you as well. Uh, I know I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for your gift. Thank you so much for owning your agency and being so strong in your constitution. And I look forward to seeing what other content you're going to create because you're just getting started, my friend. And I'm going to be rocking with you along the journey. I want all the interviews. Don't play. <laughs> I appreciate you. I'll never forget you. All right. We'll be back many times. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please make sure you tune in uh, to DR from Detroit. BT Plus streaming now. You will not be disappointed. And until next time, peace.